Amazing. Thank you very much, Emma. Let's see if ooh, this will let me do what I want to do. Can you all see that? Is that we're good? Excellent. Um, splendid. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Emma, for the for the introduction. It's lovely to see a few familiar faces from my Verges days in the audience as well, which is lovely. Um, so lovely to see you all. Um, as Emma said, I'm now at, at Bath Spa. Um, before that was Road Verges. Before that, again, um, I worked for my PhD um, at the University of Bath on sand dune plants. So pavement plants is a, is a bit of a departure, um, but it's been wonderful to see um, so much interest really in pavement plants grow, if you'll pardon the pun, there might be a few of those this evening, unwittingly, um, to see how much that interest has grown over lockdown um, and before that. So we're gonna explore some of the science um, behind our beloved pavement plants, or hopefully to become beloved pavement plants um, this evening. And these plants often go unnoticed or plants in general are considered the sort of not very interesting relative, especially when it comes to education about biology or science, which is a shame. And I realize I may be preaching to the converted to, to many of you. Um, <laughs> or in a way to sort of showcase the importance of these plants and to bring them to life and show you their world a bit more as well. I thought we'd explore these plants a bit through some of the stories as if we're sort of taking a bit of a, an imagined tour um, through a city, looking at some of the different pavement plants that, that we might find and their stories along the way. Um, and to start us off really with some of the key pioneer species, whilst not strictly plants or higher plants in the true sense, um, these organisms really and uh, pave the way, if you like, for, for pavement plants that will come in after them. Um, I did warn you there might be a pun or two. Um, so these are our wonderful lichens, mosses and liverworts. These are the uh, some of our lower plants, otherwise known as the cryptogams. Um, these essentially differ from the higher plants or the flowering plants that we're used to because they produce spores instead of seeds. And these groups of plants play a really important role, which allow our flowering pavement plants to establish. So if we take, for instance, our lichens, one of my favorite descriptions of what a lichen is, this is very geeky for you, is, is a, an algae fungus sandwich. So um, we have these two organisms that have come together in this wonderful little um, symbiosis. We have the fungus around the outside of this algal cell in the middle, which does the photosynthesis to produce the food. Um, and the fungus gives it a home. And these lichens where they set up home on our pavements, um, these two systems together, they often secrete um, acids, which start to break down the surface of the pavement or rocks, whatever they're growing on. And this sort of part of the invasion or, or growth of life on non-living surfaces is called succession, um, started off by our pioneers, the lichens. And this really helps um, to start to create bits of soil um, around our hard pavement surfaces, which allows things like the mosses to come in and colonize. The mosses come in, colonize those little crevices that the lichens have made. And as they start to go through their own life cycles and to decompose a bit, then soil starts up to, to build up around them. Alongside the mosses as well, we have these wonderfully weird looking things, if my curse will work, if you can see that in the top right hand corner. Um, which are the liverworts with these really strange umbrella looking bizarre structures. If I always think it would be quite wonderful to be small enough that you could stand under them and put yourself into the world of the liverworts on our pavements. These structures hold um, the, the male or female spores of the liverworts. And there are also these also really interesting structures. Um, the photo is probably too small to see um, on the leafy bit of a liverwort called the gamma cups. And when raindrops splash into these, they knock out tiny little leaf fragments or little clones of the liverworts, which will go on and colonize other parts of the pavement. So we really have this wonderful little ecosystem, Ooh, excuse me, my slides went funny there, um, going on. And that 
starts to give rise to this beautiful little miniature ecosystem beneath our feet, thanks to the, the mosses and lichens doing the hard work of, of creating that soil. Then the flowering plants will move in, their roots will help lock some of that soil in place. Um, and as well, each winter as they die back and decompose, then more soil is created, adding to this wonderful um, variety and diversity of life as well as all of those miniature insects and um, other organisms which will colonize the, the moss and different structures as well. And on and on the process goes until slightly bigger plants and flowering plants can colonize. So here we can see on the left, we've got the wonderfully named hairy bittercress. It's a great name. And then on the right, arguably one of the most important plants in modern plant science. So you wouldn't really believe it to look at it, would, would you really? This is um, Thaocress or Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the first plant that had its whole genome sequenced. And hundreds, if not thousands of scientists now use this poor, obscure looking thing that's used to growing in our pavements to really understand the genetic makeup of our plants and how plants fit together, how plants tick. Um, and if you're interested a bit more in this, there's a really nice book by um, Professor Nick Harbord, who was at Oxford and now at Cambridge and may now be retired. It's called From Seed to Seed, which follows the processes of following this beautiful little pavement plant and what it can tell us about plant science. So as we're thinking about these, these wonderful little ecosystems that have started to form um, and the bigger flowering plants that, that start to take hold, um, bigger communities start to form around these plants as well. So I thought I'd introduce you and some of you will be familiar with these plants, but I thought we'd, we'd delve into them in a bit more detail. One of my favorites to start off with is common bird's foot trefoil. Um, it has various really cool common names such as eggs and bacon um, or hen and chickens, referring to this beautiful little egg yolk yellow colored flowers and the red flowers as well. Um, and they're a beautiful, little slipper shape, the flowers, which is great for bees when they're foraging for pollen and nectar to, to sort of slip into and, and get the resources that they need. Bird's foot trefoil is a member of the pea family. You'll see it flowering all the way sort of through from May to October. And it's such an important plant for around 130, we think, um, different insect species that are really reliant on this. And that's both different stages of the insect's life cycle as um, the adult cycle is the butterflies and moths that are very charismatic and we know very well but also to their larvae to those famous very hungry caterpillars as well so birds with trefoil really important food plant for the larvae of the common blue butterfly and the dingy skipper that we have here um, but also really important um, as a nectar source but also larva source for one of the most common day flying moths that we have, um, the six spot burnet, which is the, the lovely red and black one at the bottom. And I thought, um, seeing as we're, we're thinking about that connection between, um, exploring that connection between plants and insects at the moment, we'd move aside for a little bit to think about um, our classic sort of food webs and interdependence between species. Here, of course, we can see something that might be very annoying to the gardeners or um, allotment enthusiasts amongst you, those pesky aphids. Um, but as we can see here, the funky looking crocodile like thing on the left hand side, some of you might recognize that that's um, one of the larval stages of a ladybird, even though it looks nothing like it. I love them. They're so bizarre and interesting, but they can actually predate the aphids so they can help lessen the impact of aphids on, on some of the plants. But we also have another relationship going on here with aphids, different types, and that's with ants. So ants often have a, a mutualistic relationship um, with the aphids. They in a way have a little farming system going on that they farm the aphids for the sweet sap that they get out of the plants. So the ants can um, use that. Um, and the aphids get some protection because the ants have this little farming system going on. They don't really want somebody to come in with the big munchy ladybird larvae to take away their, their food. So we have these interesting interdependencies going on here. And there's research being done at the moment to really think about the effect of urbanization 
um, on our food webs, particularly about how urbanization might affect different levels of the food chain. So the blue triangles here represent the herbivores, our, our lovely munchy caterpillars, um, for instance, and the, the yellow um, squares, different types of organisms that might predate those. And it's thought that in more urbanized environments, um, these food webs will be less diverse and have fewer links between them, um, even though some of those connections will likely change as well. And there's research going on to test these hypotheses, hypotheses and, and whether they're true or not. So just a, a few other interesting plants um, and their relationships and their importance to tell you about. Um, one of those is the common ragwort, which if we're talking about stories about plants, these will probably be a, a villain in, in lots of people's stories. Um, and that's because ragwort is sometimes thought in high quantities to be, um, a, to be toxic um, to animals and it's a notifiable um, weed when it's on agricultural land but it has absolutely amazing value um, for biodiversity and for wildlife. Um, the beautiful red and black moth, our lovely cinnabar moths, um, they use it as, as a nectar plant, but they're, they're caterpillars, these beautiful stripy yellow and black things, um, and their colouring acts as this amazing warning to predators to, I might be poisonous, go off and find your dinner somewhere else, please, um, bird who, who wants to eat me. Um, this system that we have going on is, is so important. So it's important, even though ragwort, we might not want it in every place where it's growing, there are different ways that we can manage it in order to allow those benefits for things like the cinnabar moth and other important butterflies like the peacock and tortoiseshell, which are, and red admirals, which are really important and use and rely on this plant. And the last sort of interesting plant pollinator story to tell you about before I move on to a few other stories towards the end is that of beautiful red valerian and um, moths that I think are really quite magical that the hummingbird hawk moth Every, anybody has been lucky enough to see one they're really quite extraordinary there have been some amazing photos going around on twitter recently there seemed to be a bit of a glut of them it's the time of year for them which is lovely and red valerian is a is a member of the honeysuckle family and it does really well in really well-drained and full sun positions. So you can quite imagine that it would be really good at colonizing the really harsh environment of the pavement. And it's an absolutely fantastic resource, both for the larvae and the adults, for the hummingbird hawk moths. So these, the beautiful caterpillars that you can see at the bottom will come along and munch their way through it. And the adults will also really rely on it for its nectar. And red valerian is, a, is an interesting plant because it was it introduced from Europe um, in the 1600s, but is now pretty much um, naturalized in the UK and can be found on our road verges in our towns and our cities and along railway cuttings as well. It's, it's spread that way. Which brings us nicely on to another story to, to tell you about um, of another plant that is faring very well along our roadsides and on pavements near roadsides. And that is the story of um, the very small and very delicate looking um, Danish scurvy grass, which is an absolute master at being able to tolerate high levels of, of salt. And despite its, its Scandinavian name, um, Danish scurvy grass is, is native to the UK, to the coastlines around the UK, but in recent times has begun to colonize our verges and our roadways and the pavements near roads because of the extensive amount of gritting that happens in the winter. So we have all of this turbulence along the roads that's spreading these seeds and the plants are doing really well because they love the salty conditions that they normally get by coastlines and they're finding that along the roads as well. So we see this amazing change in distribution. The map, um, which I hope you can sort of see, um, on the left hand side is pre-1990 and on the right is between 1990 to the current day. So you can see this huge spread of plants along the roadside, really hardy plants. Which brings me on to another of my favorite stories about um, tough plants surviving in the harsh world um, out there that we've created. And plants often can cope with lots of 
tough environmental conditions um, or have really sophisticated mechanisms to defend themselves because obviously they can't up sticks and, and, and run away. And one of those is this lovely curious case of clover and cyanide. Some clovers have the ability to defend themselves um, by producing cyanide when they're bitten into by herbivores. And that cyanide doesn't kill the herbivore or the pest, but it deters them and, and sends them off. And that is thanks to, to two genes in these clover plants that control the production of cyanide. So when um, creates a sort of a booby trap, if you like, the um, caterpillar comes along, munches on the clover, gets a really horrible taste of cyanide and decides it would much rather find dinner in another pavement side restaurant in, instead. And researchers have been looking into this a lot more recently and started to notice a really curious pattern turning up. They surveyed clovers from cities all around the world. Um, this was research done by scientists at the University of Toronto. Um, and in 160 of the cities that they looked at, which was about half of the cities in the whole, in the whole of their study, um, they noticed changes in whether the clovers could produce cyanide or were producing cyanide or not. And what they noticed, so on this um, little diagram we have here, the ye little yellow bit of the pie chart is the proportion of those plants that could produce cyanide. So what the scientists found that is the further you got away from the center of a town, the more cyanide the plants were producing. So the higher the likelihood would be that a rural a plant in a rural setting would produce nitrogen cyanide. Now, this is because cities, these sort of our big urban jungles, they act um, in a way or that the environment of them act as huge sort of evolutionary pressure that they put on plants. And it appears that clover is adapting very well to its city living life cycle, if, if you like. And the researchers think this is because there might be a reduced number of herbivores in city locations, a bit like we looked at with the food webs earlier. And this means that there's a trade-off in the clover plants. They, instead of putting energy into producing the cyanide, they can, that would deter herbivores, because there are fewer herbivores, they can get away with not really doing that. So they put their resources instead in perhaps adapting to reduced water supplies instead, and the, the opposite for bigger needs to create cyanide to ward off herbivores in more rural locations. So we have this interesting um, variation across the, this sort of range of urbanization. And one other sort of evolutionary tinge story to, to tell you about is a, another curious pavement plant, that of um, the holy hawksbeard, um, Crepis sancta, which produces two different types of fruit. It produces um, the classic sort of dandelion-esque seed, if you like, with the little parachutes, umbrellas, but it also produces a heavier type of seed, which doesn't have the little parasol to help it be dispersed by wind. And researchers um, in Montpellier in France have been looking at the science behind this, and they started to notice that these smaller, lighter seeds with the umbrellas were starting to disappear. They weren't seeing them as often. And what they think that's going on here is that because these seeds could drift away and potentially land on tarmac a lot more often and not find any soil to germinate in, then that puts those seeds at a disadvantage. Whereas these bigger, heavier seeds are much more likely to fall directly into the soil. Maybe say if this hawk beard is um, hawk's beard is living in a tree pit or something like that, the seeds could fall directly in there and have a lovely place in which to germinate and have more success. So in a relatively short time span in terms of evolution, so only in about 10 to 12 years, the scientists noticed that around Montpellier, these hawk beards were producing a larger proportion of these big heavy seeds to boost their odds of um, reproducing well. And the final lovely plant story to, to share with you, final curiosity, 
is that of a vampire plant, um, often found lurking in UK car parks or the pavements um, in these urban areas. And um, this is the discovery from a year or so ago by scientists at the University of Oxford and the Natural History Museum, finding a new variety um, of these parasitic plants called the broom rapes, um, the orobanchi. These plants um, are plant pilferers, if you like. They steal their food from other, from the roots of other plants around them. And that's because they produce hardly any chlorophyll, that all important pigment that allows plants to produce their own energy from the sun. These vampire plants don't do that. Um, and scientists have discovered a, a new variety of, of these plants living in, having, enjoying living in these um, exclusive urban locations. And I think really it's wonderful stories like this that can really turn people's heads and start to get people thinking differently about plants and very quickly, um, so I don't take up too much of, of our time um, for chatting about things. Just a few stories that and projects that I've really loved about celebrating pavement plant life. This project now is, is about 10 years old. Um, it was put together by the landscape designer, um, teacher and writer, David Seiter, um, who works in New York, all about um, really uh, celebrating this underappreciated plant life in the city and, and finding ways to highlight its value, a bit like the, the More Than Weeds project more recently, really in an effort to champion both the ecology, but also the aesthetics and beauty of how they called it informal vegetation, which I quite liked as a term through lots of different illustrations and in different ways as well. And then finally, to leave you um, with things to think about around the sort of ongoing work to tackle the phenomenon of plant blindness or perhaps better called plant awareness disparity, the sort of phenomenon where our human brains are hardwired to ignore the slow growing greenery around us. Um, and that's through different ways that different researchers and um, practitioners are working. There's a lovely project called Plant Love Stories and Plant Heart Art, really celebrating our own personal connections um, to plants and stories as well, as well as there was a beautiful project um, between researchers here in the UK and in Sweden as well, and Norway, I think, called the Beyond Plant Blindness Project, using art to tell sort of the ecological stories um, of the plants as well. So there we are. And I suppose the sort of final message is that even if um, pavement plants aren't suitable absolutely everywhere, um, of course, there'll be places where access needs are, are um, more important, but I think it's so important to foster a, a love of these plants, whether that's through our own connections with them, encouraging people to share these stories or um, sort of lifting the lid on the hidden world of plants um, in, in some way. And I hope tonight that's given you a few things maybe um, of new stories to, to share with other people. And I'd love to hear your stories too, if anybody has stories that they'd love to share. Um, I'm more than happy to, to take questions sort of on this or, or road voting type stuff or, or anything really. So I will stop rambling and leave us leave us enough time to, to chat and to share, share things too. Thank you.